Hello, friends. I am overjoyed to be with you in this sacred place. And if this is your first diocesan convention, on behalf of all of us, I welcome you here. We are so glad that you are part of our community now. And if you are a seasoned member of this diocesan gathering, we are very grateful for your faithfulness and your wisdom. And I wonder if you might just take a moment to look around and say to somebody next to you that you're really glad to see that person. Just say, just to say. <laughs> I want to remind you that we will pick up the Eucharist after lunch today. Theodicy will be back with us to lead us with their amazing music. Andy Barnett from Theodicy is going to be in the diocese all week. Theodicy will be back next weekend for three musical events, culminating in the Absalom Jones service with presiding Bishop Michael Curry, Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock. Please come back. If it's really great to, um, to welcome all of us back to the cathedral, and I want, on behalf of all of us, to thank the cathedral staff for their gracious hospitality. We're in a new format, as you heard. Remember, for two years, we were at Reed Temple, which was a site that easily accommodated workshops as part of convention. And we came back to the convention for a one-day governance gathering based on your feedback. Many of, you, many of you told us that while you valued the workshops at convention, there simply wasn't enough time to delve into the subject matter, and the people that would have most benefited from those workshops weren't necessarily your delegates to convention. So this year, one governance session followed by two leadership days in late February and early March so that your leaders can pick the most convenient site and engage deeply in subjects that are most helpful to them. We have assembled an extraordinary team of teachers and facilitators from around the diocese and around the country. And that's all coming ahead. You have information about that in your flyers and also on the website. Inspired worship, again, with our presiding bishop and then practical resources to assist you in leadership and in ministry. But we're here today taking up the governance responsibilities of our church. Each one of us is here because at some point we committed our lives to Jesus. It might have been a conscious decision, it was for me. It might have been for you a more gradual awareness. But regardless of how it happened, we're here because of our love for Jesus and our desire to follow him. And we're also here, each one of us, because we have found our home, our spiritual home, in the Episcopal Church. And maybe it's been your home forever. Or perhaps you discovered the Episcopal Church along the way. Regardless, we're all here because we've chosen. Or, or maybe, like with me, you felt that God chose you to be a part of this particular branch of the Jesus movement. And we're here today as stewards of the faith. We're the ones God has entrusted with responsibility to the Episcopal Church to be the Episcopal Church in our respective communities, which is a sacred trust. And I'm honored to share it with you. And this is what I have on my heart to say. We have come to a decisive moment in the Episcopal Diocese of Washington I have come to such a moment as your bishop. It's been four years since you blessed me with the greatest vocational gift and challenge of my life, to serve God and the people of this diocese as bishop. And we've spent the last four years getting to know each other. You have been kind, supportive, and inspiring. And I've grown to love you. I'm honored to serve you and I gladly give my whole heart to this work. And God willing, we will share this adventure for years to come. First four years have been dedicated to building relationships and trust 
you entrusted me or you gave me the role of leadership at my election, but I have to earn your trust every day. And that only comes with time and shared experience. Based on priorities you articulated during the transition between bishops, we've redirected diocesan resources and staff toward the areas that matter most now, congregational vitality, resources for Christian discipleship and spiritual growth, equipping leaders, and the work of justice that we share as disciples of Christ. Together in these four years, we've undertaken a deep evaluation of the ministries that are funded and managed at the diocesan level, and that includes, among others, campus and young adult ministry, Latino ministry, ministry among the deaf, diocesan level youth ministry and Camp Edao, and diocesan support for the Bishop Walker School. And in these areas and more, we are doing good and important work together. But we've come now to the end of this first season. I'm no longer the new bishop. Darn. <laughs> no more excuses for showing up late on Sunday morning. We've articulated key priorities. We've assessed core ministries. And of course, that will continue. And we re we've arrived at this moment when we turn our gaze now to the next four or five years and the five years after that. These last six months have been a time of prayer and soul searching for me. I've had a lot of conversations across the diocese. I continue my study of Christian communities that are thriving in the cultural and spiritual context in which we live. And there are a lot of them all around us from whom we can learn. Like you, I love the Episcopal Church. And for years, Long before I knew you, I felt this claim on my heart to do all in my power to ensure that this church, our faith community, learns to thrive, learns to sufficiently adapt and engage the world that we live in now so that more people might experience Christ through the treasured insights and expressions of our church. But there is no guarantee that we will succeed in this adaptive work. Some of our congregations will succeed, but how many? Almost all will continue to exist, but how many will thrive? And what might we do now to ensure that as many of our congregations adapt and thrive so that in five or 10 years, we're stronger as a church now with greater capacity to serve the vision entrusted to us. Stronger, able to welcome more people, able to live as our expression of church in the world. Having served as your bishop for four years, this is what I know, that the challenges are bigger than any one congregation can meet on its own. The opportunities are greater than any one congregation can fulfill on its own. And the vision entrusted to us is larger than any one congregation can realize on its own. And for these reasons, among all that we'll undertake at this convention, there are two main tasks before us. First, I ask you to approve a change in our governance structure that would rename, realign, and reinvigorate our regions as a foundation for increased collaboration. And second, to approve a diocesan budget that reflects a shared commitment to our common life and devotes an unprecedented level of resources to increasing collaboration between congregations, and financial health for all. These are important decisions for a decisive moment. But you know, as well as I, that by far, the most interesting stories in the Bible are of people at decisive moments. People who are called upon to make a choice in response to challenging circumstances and to do something brave. 
and the decisions they made in faithfulness to God's call had life transforming implications not only for them but for others. Think of Ruth, a young foreigner who chooses to follow her mother-in-law Naomi back to the land of Israel with these words, do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And so her lineage came to be part of the tree, of the fruits, of the community of the people of Israel, grandmother of David. Or think of the Gospels and the young boy standing among the hungry multitudes who offers to Jesus what he has, five loaves, a few fish. When common sense and self-protection would say, hold on to what you have, the boy chose to give. And through his gift, the multitudes were fed with baskets left over. Decisive moments are times when critical need and exciting opportunities come together. They are every bit as holy as experiences of unanticipated grace that just seem to happen, uninvited and unplanned, as a sign of God's love. Decisive moments are also grace, but they don't just happen. As the word implies, we have a decision to make. And that decision has far-reaching implications because it's based on a vision that we dare to believe that God wants for us. Back when I was a member of the Credo faculty, the organization that provides wellness retreats for Episcopal clergy, I used to guide people through a seemingly simple but courageous process of self-examination that went something like this. First, you start in some area of your life with an honest assessment of where you are right now. And then you follow that trajectory if you made no changes at all in that area of your life to the most likely outcome. And then you ask the question, what might God's will be for me in this area of my life? What might God's preferred future be? And then identify steps you could take now to move toward that future instead of the trajectory that you're on. Now with any life assessment, personal, it's good to start with an audit, if you will, of all that's good and strong inside but each one of us has potential for great things that we can't accomplish on our own, and we all need to take step, steps toward areas of great potential. They don't just happen, and each of us has struggles in life that we'd, we'd rather ignore. And in the demands and distractions of life, it's easy, you know, to go on autopilot, moving from one day to the next without sufficient thought for the future. But personally, what are the consequences of not putting ourselves in a place of great potential and for not tending to the things we'd rather avoid? It takes courage to stop and ask the question, if I continue in this way, where will I likely end up? And then to ask the question of God, to ask for help to envision a different potential to move toward, that opens us up to the possibility of a decisive moment of grace. And to use a similar process in our congregations is at the heart of strategic planning. All of our congregations are blessed with areas of strength in some, er in some part of their ministry. And admittedly, some have more strength than others. All have places of untapped opportunity and unrealized potential. All have blind spots and barriers to growth. And while there's enough, God knows every day to occupy us and keep us very busy at what we're doing now, 
if we don't address those areas of untapped opportunity and unrealized potential and untended challenges, you and I can, can predict with considerable accuracy where the future will hold. We can do it. We can just track it right now. Go back five years, follow the trend to where you are now, project out another five years. Now, looking across the diocese, there is so much to celebrate and ample reason to hope. Again, taking stock, starting with the good. We have lots of good reason to love our church, and I am proud of who you are and what we are accomplishing together. Just a few examples. We're in the third year of a new ordination process for the priesthood, but this year we launched a long-awaited ordination track for deacons. And last October, we approved 15 people as postulants, and they have begun their education and formation process. And by the end of next year, the first cohorts will be ordained for ministry of service throughout the diocese. And we have been so blessed by those who have worked countless hours on this initiative. And we have so much to be thankful for in those who are saying yes to servant ministry in Jesus' name. Our multicultural ministry has also deepened in the last four years. Our Spanish-speaking congregations, with a long history of collaboration, have undergone many changes just in the recent years. Three now are entirely supported at the congregational level, and the remaining three are on a path toward self-sufficiency, including one of our largest congregations, St. Matthew San Mateo, that regularly draws five to 600 people on a weekend. Clergy of multicultural congregations continue to meet regularly as they have for years, and as part of the leadership days in February, over 50 lay and clergy multicultural leaders have committed to a two-day workshop with the Reverend Eric Law and the Kaleidoscope Institute. Kaleidoscope has a proven track record across the church for improving and strengthening multicultural congregations within our church, within the Episcopal Church. Another area of good and important work as you know, without question, one of the most important times in the life of, the con of a congregation, of all of your congregations, is during leadership, clergy leadership transition. And it's also the time when you rightfully expect and need to be well supported by your diocese. So this is a high priority. And it's one of the most significant ways that we as a diocese invest in one another. And in the last four years since I've been here, 48 of our congregations over half have experienced or are experiencing now clergy transitions. We're in the midst of a generational shift in the leadership of our churches. And among those right now is Washington National Cathedral. And as you heard and may know, I am serving as the interim dean. That was a decision made, by the way, in consultation with Diocesan Council and the Standing Committee, as well as cathedral leadership. And among the many reasons I felt God asking me to do this work is to strengthen the ties between the cathedral and the diocese. The cathedral is a treasure for all of us, for the wider church, and for the nation. And in partial compensation for my time, the cathedral is contributing $75,000 above its annual gift that you will see in the diocesan budget, which I have earmarked, I've asked us in council to earmark for investing in the financial well-being of our congregations. So let me say just a word briefly about the Confederate flag windows um, in response to our good friend and colleague, Robert Hunter. Um, Dean Hall, um, as you know, right at the time around the, uh, the killings in Charlottesville and the, the Charleston killings and the, and the conversation around the country regarding the placement of cathedral flags, Confederate flags, excuse me, and um, other iconography from the Confederate era, called for the removal of the windows that are in the cathedral. 
Um, to be honest, up until that time, neither he nor I knew about the windows. We just didn't know about them. Um, he himself did not have the authority to remove the windows by himself, just as you wouldn't have, as a clergy person, the authority to remove any windows in your congregation. He asked the cathedral chapter to engage that process. And I can gladly report to you that the cathedral chapter has formed a task force. There are several people of the diocese, the wider diocese, who are serving on that, and they are undertaking that work. What I have said to them is that from my perspective, regardless of the decision with the windows, the most important thing that we do in this period is examine our history so that we really understand the history of the Civil War, the post-Civil War period, the end of Reconstruction, the rise of re renewed segregation, the rise of Jim Crow, the glorification of the Confederacy, and the desire among white Americans to unify at the exclusion of African Americans in this country. We must understand that history. We must understand how it is embedded in our architecture, not only here, but around the nation. I dare say in more of our congregations. And we must repent of that history so that we are not bound by it. In that light, what happens to the windows will be understood in the context of that conversation and we will come to that conclusion then. And so I invite your prayers for the cathedral and its work and I ask you to consider if in your architecture or in your communities there is similar work to be done. So there's a lot to celebrate. There's a lot to give thanks for in the diocese. God is good. God is good all the time. And Jesus is Lord, and the Spirit is here, and many are working very hard. You're all working very hard in faithfulness and in love. And yet, I ask myself almost every day, almost every day, if we continue on the path we're on right now, what does the future hold? If we follow the trajectory of our 88 congregations, of our 88 congregations on the course they're on right now, what do we see? What do we see? Without doubt, some of our congregations will be stronger in the next five to 10 years with greater capacity to serve Christ's mission in the future. Some will continue on a path of steady decline. Most, most, despite lots of hard and faithful work, will simply plateau where they are now or at a slightly larger size because they are at capacity, structural, spiritual, relation, relational, in terms of imagination, just at capacity. And when you're at capacity, you plateau. And so even with our best efforts now, the trajectory of congregational growth suggests some growth, some decline, most plateau. I believe that God has a preferred future for the Episcopal Church. Do you believe that God has a preferred future for the Episcopal Church? Yes. It beckons us. It beckons us. It is a future in which all of our congregations are vibrant, strong gatherings of people, people who have experienced the mystery of faith, a palpable sense of God's love for them, a transformative experience of the risen Christ. It's a future where our congregations are bursting at the seam with people who are deeply engaged in their Christian practice, prayer, scripture study, hospitality and peacemaking, loving God, loving neighbor, serving their communities and working for justice in our land. In God's preferred future, we are raising up children in spiritual confidence, and we are honoring our elders for their wisdom. In God's preferred future, our worship is joyful and our people are singing. And we are known in our communities for showing up and really caring about our neighbors and really caring for refugees. The, and now, 
you know as well as I, there are signs of this future all around us. There are seeds of this future God has planted. They are taking root in our soil. But the challenges are bigger than any one congregation can meet on its own. The opportunities are greater, and the vision entrusted to us is larger than any one congregation can realize on its own. We need each other. And so I propose that we take this next season of our life together, the next four years, to take stock of key areas of congregational vitality and do that work in collaboration with one another rather than alone. That we take time to assess the changes in our neighborhoods and communities and, and the world and to do that work together, not alone. That we learn together who our neighbors are and what God is up to in their lives and how we might know and love them for their sake and for God's. Many of our congregations, most of our congregations, are already in the midst of some kind of strategic discerning work, and I commend you for that. But most of you are doing that work in isolation, as if you were the Episcopal Church alone, and everything about your future rested on your shoulders alone. As if the eye said to the hand, I have no need of you. And if we continue on that path, at best, we will have 88 separate strategies for the future, which doesn't feel like the best stewardship of our planning efforts. It makes, um, makes the diocesan staff run really fast on a hamster wheel. And surely, we're stronger together than we are alone. I know we're wiser together. The ideas that you all have if you could share them with one another more freely, would produce tremendous fruit. We see more possibilities together. We share wisdom. We pool resources. And together, we could more wise, wisely allocate diocesan resources with strategic vision, no longer responding, as we do most of the time now, to each need or request for support in isolation. So that brings us to the first of our two decisions for the day, voting on a new regional structure that we discussed in the meetings last fall, in which we would divide the diocese into eight geographically based and named regions from which strategic work could take place, building upon the already wonderful work already undertaken in so many of our congregations and considering the commonalities for common mission. Now, you've asked, and you know it's true, that the new regional structure does not discourage other relationships, God forbid, uh, for the basis of mission and ministry. It's simply one. It's just a foundation linked to our governance and representation. Once they're established, the regional bodies could exercise real authority in establishing priorities and making requests for allocated resources. Each region would then elect representatives to diocesan council with authority and accountability to take back to the regions for decisions that we make at that level. Now, yeah, it's going to take time and effort to build this, but the potential for fruitful ministry seems so much greater than if we continue on the individualized paths that we're on now. And so I ask for your support and commitment not only to the vote today, which frankly is the easiest part, but to the collaborative ministry process that we could then create together. The second decision before convention is the passage of the Dawson budget for 2016. And a budget, as you know, is a statement of shared commitment. This budget is unique compared to others, from, to those of other years, in that it includes in the budget what we ask of each congregation, which this year is a one percentage point increase of normal operating income from all of the congregations currently not at a 10% tithe. Now, naturally, that's aspirational, but it's also really important. If, as Jesus taught us, money reveals what we value, we have cause for concern. In the year 2000, I'm told, the diocese moved from a partially mandatory assessment to an all-voluntary giving, giving policy to the diocese. 
with an understanding that each congregation would work toward a 10% tithe. And most made the effort toward that tithe, I'm told, until the economic troubles of 2008, and I dare say a few um, contentious decisions made in the Episcopal Church in that era. And while the economy has improved, many of our congregations are still struggling financially. Last year, 2015, six of our 88 congregations tithed the diocese. 22 gave 3% of their income or less, and the average is 5%. And the sad thing for me was that as a diocese, we came to expect that, that low level of giving as a symptom of the financial vulnerabilities of many of our congregations without really doing anything about it. Now, if we're honest, there are other reasons for that low investment. For some, it reflects a lack of engagement in diocesan ministries. For others, a lack of confidence that the money is wisely invested. For others, it's the historical legacy of a breakdown of relationship with diocesan leadership. Um, and then the Dawson Convention, a few years back, voted to use all of the income from the SOPER Fund to fund diocesan level ministries, which took a lot of the urgency away because it allowed us to live with a diocesan standard of living without having to make that commitment for ourselves, with consequences I'll address in a moment. For most, however, I suspect it's simply the understandable desire to take care of parish needs first. And do parish needs ever stop? No. I was a rector for 18 years, I remember. But we're at a decisive moment now, and I'm asking you, I am asking you to raise your commitment, not to me, not to the diocese as some far off entity, but to one another, and for the possibility of greater fruitfulness for us all. And I ask this knowing full well the financial challenges your congregations face. And addressing those challenges is now, for me and for us, a top priority. Not because of the diocesan budget, because, but because of what it means for you and your communities. We need a financial strategy. We need a plan to address the shortage of funds that is constricting ministry and hampering opportunities for growth. Because if we follow the trends, financial trends, and look ahead five to 10 years, the issue of this vulnerability becomes even more compelling. Many of our congregations are financially dependent on one or two disproportionately high pledges to make budget. Most, most of our congregations have an aging membership and some are dipping into reserves of their endowments to pay the bills. And for many, the cost of maintaining our beautiful but old and expensive and inefficient buildings completely overwhelms other ministry imperatives. I don't think that's our financial destiny. I dare to believe that God has a different future for us, a preferred future where we can grow stronger financially so that our mission might have the resources it needs. Other churches, other nonprofits are raising money right now to great success, and we can learn from them. But first, we have to talk about this. We have to talk about money with one another. And so this year, I'm asking you to talk to one another and to talk to me not via email or phone calls, but face-to-face. -face. And we're going to start these face-to-face -face congregations with those congregations that are tithing now and those who are making significant increases this year in your giving to thank you, first of all, and to learn how we might partner together. And then we're going to talk with those who cannot or choose not to meet the percentage point increase so that we might better understand the challenges that you're facing and explore ways to address them. And this will be a relationship building exercise. 
If there are old wounds that are lingering, let's, let's meet and work to heal them so that we can write a new chapter of diocesan ministry together. And as you see in the budget and in the narrative budget that accompanies it, all the increases in revenue from this tithe or one percentage point increase will go to invest in the financial health and strength of the congregations and to restore the SOPR trust, the SOPR funds, to its original purpose, which is to provide grant and seed money for congregations. Um, there are three ways the, the budget will do that. You can read about it if you're getting bored with my talking and it's in your packet, or you can wait until Council Moderator Maureen Shea explains them in later detail in just a moment. I just want to say a few more things. The budget recognizes that not every congregation can, can meet this request, and we understand that. Of course we understand that. And so our categories of investment are necessarily contingent upon what you can actually give. But hear me on this, I am determined to make you proud to support our common mission. I'm determined that we are all committed to a ministry that we share and that there is demonstrated fruitfulness for that investment. So those are the two major areas of business today and the votes are decisive. But they're not, they're not entirely new what I'm asking you to consider with your votes today is already happening across the diocese. Many of the congregations have already responded generously to the 2016 budget. As of today, we've received 34 pledges, which is higher than most years at this time, 28 of which, 28 of which are increases. Five, yes, five have committed to the tithe, 11 to the one percentage point increase. That is astonishing and wonderful. And there are already established and new examples of collaboration across the diocese. I'm just going to name a few. The parishes on Capitol Hill are actively engaged with one another, serving their neighborhood, collaborating in liturgy and program to, to share their resources and increase their joy. The Georgetown parishes are doing much the same, not only with themselves, but with their wider community of churches to address homelessness in the city and other neighborhood needs. Just recently, the parishes in central Montgomery County have covenanted with Canon Joey Rick to begin this month developing a common strategy and discerning a financial plan to accomplishment. And leaders from central Prince George's County expressed a strong desire to do something similar when we met in December. Three congregations last summer came together to sponsor a joint mission trip. And next summer, five parishes will be participating. Some congregations in leadership transition are asking whether it makes sense now, as they did in the past, to share clergy. There's a great success story in Charles County, and St. Mary's, a few congregations in St. Mary's and Montgomery County are in various stages of considering that same thing. Um, clergy in Southern Maryland, as you know, are historic in their collegiality and deep friendship. And the campus ministries have now begun to think of themselves as a campus ministry for the diocese. They've got one banner now instead of one for each university. And they function, the chaplains, as a team. I could go on. But in closing, I'd simply like to remind you of another decisive moment from the Gospels. It's a, taken from the Gospel of John. It's actually right after the story of the loaves and fishes. And Jesus is going on and on, as he does, as you know from last summer, all the I'm the bread of life <laughs> passages that we preached on for the month of July. And right at the end of that chapter, it's a glorious chapter, and right at the end of it, the, the gospel writer says that Jesus' teaching had become so hard that many of those following him decided that they'd had enough. According to the text, they simply left and no longer went about with him. And in that moment, just imagine that moment, Jesus is with the 12, and he asks them, what about you? It brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it. What about you? Do you also wish to go away? It's like he's opening the door, you know, if you want to go. 
And Simon Peter, speaking for the 12, says, Lord, to whom would we go? We believe that you hold the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. They had they'd come way too far to turn back. Their lot was with him. I have no doubt in my mind that you have cast your lot with Jesus. And I hope that you know that in faithfulness to him, I have cast my lot with you. And I feel your prayers and support and affection for me. Today, through our prayers and deliberations and decisions, the question we're actually grappling at the heart of this convention is, will we cast our lot with one another? Can the eye say to the hand, I have no need of you? We're part of the body of Christ and individually members of it. We, we're it, we're the Episcopal Church in the counties of St. Mary's, Charles, Prince George's, and Montgomery. There's no one else, it's us. And we are the Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. We've come to a decisive moment. Will you walk with one another toward God's preferred future together? Will you? Will you?